Good morning and welcome, uh, both to those here and who are watching at home. Uh, we're here for a time of worship together and fellowship, an opportunity to love one another and to uh, walk in the presence of God. I'd like to uh, bring your attention to Rooted Together. There's lots of uh, information in here about activities and uh, coming up. One which I'd like to draw your attention to is that uh, a call is going out uh, for volunteers for community night. Uh, that a team is needed to uh, coordinate what's going to happen and make sure it does happen. So uh, you can contact Kirsten. The contact information is in Rooted Together, so make sure to check your email or grab a copy uh, in paper. Now something not in Rooted Together is that on Sat next Saturday, the 25th at 7 p.m., there's going to be a drive-in movie night here that is free and there's snacks available. And so uh, for those who are interested, come on down and enjoy a movie together with one another. This time I turn it to Tim and have a blessed day. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together in body or in spirit to read our call to worship. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.
Lord Jesus, we are your people who you have redeemed. We come to you this morning out of whatever brokenness that we see in ourselves, that others see in us, knowing your healing power, your saving power, and that um, we can praise you out of that place of brokenness. We thank you for welcoming us here with open arms. We pray that you would show to us today your goodness, your mercy, and your love as we are in your house together. Amen. Whether from afar or whatever, give each other virtual hugs or fist pumps or whatever. Uh, and you may be seated as well. It's good to be with you in the house of the Lord. And, and um, well, not that this is only house. Uh, one of the things I've found myself praying a lot uh, lately has been Elisha's prayer when they're surrounded by a great army and he prays for a servant that his servant's eyes would be open to see God's presence. Because God is ever present and sometimes I just need my, to have my eyes open up to see that reality. And I pray that that would be helpful to you as you go through life and you're struggling, God, what is going on? Life's out of control. I pray that your eyes would be open, that God is present with you in the midst of that. Uh, I'm often drawn to uh, Jesus sleeping in the boat, and the disciples are like, Lord, don't you care? We're drowning here. And I just need to realize Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is in the boat. And so I pray that that would be encouragement. Uh, So let's have some time for silent prayer. Uh, and maybe you need to pray like David did in the end of Psalm 139. I appreciate David's honesty. Uh, one of his lines is, Lord, keep me from willful prayer uh, and willful sin. Keep me from willful sin. David knew his own heart. There are times when he wanted to purposefully, willfully sin, and so he asked God to help him with that. And here we have the end of Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart, and test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Maybe that's how you start your silent prayer. Uh, but let's pray uh, as we set our hearts in asking God to do a mighty work in us. Father, you know our hearts. At times, they want to praise you. At times, it seems like maybe I'll just speak for myself. There's open rebellion. Lord, I pray that you would just reveal to me, to us, if there's anything in me, in us, that is keeping us from fully living for you that you'd remove it. That is keeping us, me, from representing you well to the people around you, that you'd reveal that. Lord, I know, as Scripture says, when we say, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, Paul, as he writes those words, is, is making a bold declaration Caesar is not. Nobody else is. Nothing else is. Forgive us when we make idols of things and chase after those things that are not you. Help us to yield fully to your lordship. Lord, our hearts ache when we are confronted with a world that just doesn't seem like it should be. And we wonder, God, where are you? Are you even there? Do you care?
Open our eyes to you. Help us to realize that our faith in you should not be based on our circumstances, should not be based upon our possessions, but should, we should desire you, God, and you alone. We should desire you and not just not your blessings. We should chase after you. So I pray that you would move us in that. Help us to navigate these days with love. Lord, there seems to be so much angst and and finger pointing and name calling. And yet, Jesus, we know that you told us to love our enemies. That catches me. I squirm when I hear that. And yet I also know in Scripture it tells us we were once enemies of you, God. But you loved us. You loved us in such a way that you brought us into your kingdom. You adopted us into your forever family. So Lord, as we fully yield to that truth, we pray that you would move our hearts. That we would declare that you are more important than our possessions. You are more important than our health. It's you, God. I pray that you would move us there. I do pray that you would continue to uh, help with the distributions of the vaccines and be with the medical field. Lord, the workers in the medical field who are just stretched to the limit, who are tired, who don't seem like they have enough help. I was hearing in Sunday school class today that uh, UMass didn't even have a nurse in triage because they just didn't have the bodies. We pray that you'd raise up new medical workers especially those who love you. What a blessing it would be to have somebody in the medical field, and I thank you for our doctors who are here, uh, Stephen Childs and Peter Murphy, that they love you, but they also are practicing medicine. They can talk on a spiritual level with those who are willing to listen. I thank you for them. But we pray that you'd help us to navigate these days of of COVID and and we want to live by faith and and yet we want to walk responsibly. Help us to navigate these days with love, especially. Pray for those who are, are struggling with illnesses and for those who are caring for loved ones whose races are near the end. Lord, especially for those caregivers, we pray for sustaining grace and mercy. We pray for those who are looking to get married in the coming months. We just pray that you prepare their hearts that they would come to a place where they're willing to stick a stake in the ground and say, here I stand, I'm not leaving. I pray for all of us, single or married or young or old, or that we would just say, you're it, Jesus. Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we'd bind ourselves fully to you. But we do pray for healing. We pray for healing of physical healing, spiritual healing, and emotional healing. We know so often, so many young people have struggled during this time of of COVID. We know so many young people, especially women, have struggled with social media. The fact that Facebook's own research shows that their product, Instagram, increases within young women. 
depression, angst by 30%. Forgive us when we begin to buy into the lie and, and see our self-worth as something that needs to be compared to others instead of finding our identity grounded fully in you. We are grateful, Lord. Hear us as we pray together the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading is taken from Ecclesiastes. Chapter 7, verse 20, found on page 1042 in your pew Bibles. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. The Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. Luke chapter 7 verse 36 through 50 found on page 1604 in your pew Bibles. Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had bigger debt had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven loves little. Little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has served, saved you. Go in peace. And the New Testament reading today is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, found on page 1846 in your pew Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We would take our offering, but I encourage you there will be baskets either outside or right here at the front. Certainly online giving is available as well. We thank you for your gifts. And so reflect on these uh, words as Deb plays them, these words uh, written by Charles Wesley. So let us prepare our hearts in our giving. You may be seated. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. And I pray that you continue to help us to grow in understanding what it means to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. I pray that you'd help us to understand what that means in terms of our interactions with each other, but also how we view what you've given us. Lord, may we see what we think is ours as on loan, 
Lord, and may we be good stewards of what you have given us. So I thank you for this opportunity to give, and we pray that you would use it and multiply it for your kingdom purposes. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Uh, there is a recent commercial that reminds me of my days gone by. It's a Geico commercial that has Yogi Bear and Boo Boo <laughs> crashing a picnic. And Yogi ends with his class line, I'm smarter than the average bear. Now I know that even as I say that, there are some of you who have no clue who Yogi Bear is, have never seen Yogi Bear, and that's just a shame. I mean, and Russell is he's thinking, I don't know who Yogi is, and Charlotte's like, yeah, whoever, boo-boo, whoever, you know, they have no clue. Um, but his line, I'm smarter than the average bear, and it kind of makes me think of another show. It was a news, uh, the news from Lake Wobegon, and his introduction in the news from Lake Wobegon were, all the women are strong, and all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average. We like this idea of being above average. And speaking of average, now I'm going to ask you to kind of raise your hands and be honest. How many of you think you're an above-average driver? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Some of you are not. I think some of you are lying. I think you all think you're above average. Uh, if you're watching at home, you can jump up and down. Yes, I'm above average driver. Uh, just be honest. You can probably be more honest at home knowing that no one's watching you. Or this question, when it comes to driving, do you feel safer when you're driving or when you're sitting in the passenger seat? My guess is, is when you're driving because you feel like you're an above average driver and the person you're riding with probably isn't that's my guess i could be wrong in that the study though says that 93 percent of us think we're better than average drivers so a bunch of you are lying in this hand raising exercise and if we're honest we probably think we're better than average more knowledgeable than others in many areas of our life and not just driving am i right or am i just speaking to myself my guess is a lot of us think we're we're smarter and above average and have it all figured out so i'd encourage you to read a book by brant hansen entitled the truth about us um easy read i read it in maybe a little under a day or a little over a day uh, Jason Romeo graciously handed this to Eileen as we were heading to their place for part of our sabbatical time. Uh, I know Jason is a fan of Brant Hansen. Brant has a podcast, and I think Jason listens to pretty regularly. Jason, you would like to know that when I mentioned Brant Hansen, Chip was like, I can't believe that you know about Brant Hansen. I listened to his podcast. In fact, he's emailed Brant Hansen, and Brant referred to his email in one of his podcasts. So you've got a fellow fan in Chip Seymour with your Brant Hansen. He's also written a book called Unoffendable. I'd recommend both of them to you. But this one is called The Truth About Us. Uh, so where some of those studies are found. So this morning we're going to look at three encounters with Jesus to see what we can learn. Uh, we, a handful of youth and I, looked at these very same passages this summer. This is before even I got my hands on this book. I wasn't even thinking about Brant at that time. And uh, the more, though, I think about these passages, these encounters with Jesus, the more I'm a little squirmish. Well, let me explain a little bit. As, as many of you may, or some of you probably don't, may not know, I've spent years facilitating wilderness trips and ropes courses. That was my thing. And as a, especially as a ropes course facilitator with especially Christian groups, and Charlotte can attest to this, she's probably heard my spiel, uh, I would introduce the ropes course by saying something like this. 
your success today doesn't depend on what anybody else does. Some of you are really terrified of heights, and some of you would do cartwheels on a balance beam 40 feet in the air. You would have no problem. Some of you have no problem. The challenge we face is believing that, be, that because so often our success is based on comparison. And I would go and say, well, let's take an example. You get a test back from school. Now, I'm sure this is none of this has ever happened to you, younger friends. You get a 70, and you're feeling like, hmm, eh, not so great. Maybe you're ecstatic. I don't know. But maybe you're feeling 70. Then you ask the next question, which we all do or were asked by somebody else. What did you get? And your friend that you asked got a 60. All of a sudden, you're feeling a little better about that 70. And the person behind you got a 65, and you're feeling even better, better about your 70. You see, all of a sudden, our success is based upon the comparison. So I would tell, while on the ropes course, what I would say is, what I'm asking you to do is your best. And that will look different than what anybody else does today. So after this spiel that I give, I would share my much-used favorite line. Comparison is straight from the pit of hell. I would share that. Tim Keller says it probably a little more eloquently. Comparison is the thief of joy. But anyways, I believe this. I believe that comparison is straight from the pit of hell. But I also subtly find myself buying into the comparison bug. In some cases, it has to do with a low view of myself sometimes, and sometimes I beat on myself, and I'm like, oh, look at that guy. He's got hundreds of kids in the youth groups. You know, and it's just a whole comparison thing. But often, I have to be honest, it has to do with an overinflated view of myself. And that view is often birthed out of pride. And no matter what shape it manifests itself in, it skews my, it skews our ability to see myself or ourself and others in a healthy light. So Paul, when he's writing Romans 12 and verse 3, he says, For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. I don't always do that. I think I'm great. But with this reminder from Paul in mind, let's take a look at these three encounters with Jesus, starting with the familiar account of the wee little man, Zacchaeus. And I know even as I say wee little man, I've already implanted an earworm, because you're singing that song in your head. I know. I'm sorry. I Forgive me. Uh, <clears throat> but this wee little man, Zacchaeus, let's look at that. But before we do, let's give it some context here. Just the chapter before, in chapter 18, we read that Jesus, surrounded by some people, he's maybe listening, maybe seeing, observing something, He sees that people, some people, are thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. In fact, it says in verses Luke 18, 9 through 14, it starts out with saying, there were some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. It's a comparison bug. So Jesus tells a story about two men. You know this parable, right? There's a Pharisee and a tax collector, and they go up to the temple to pray. It's a familiar tale, parable, which is a story to convey a point. So the Pharisee goes in, and he Thanks, God. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even this tax collector. And then he goes on and on and on about all the good things he does for God. 
You see, his spiritual success all of a sudden is based upon comparing himself to those he looked down on. And man, he's a good guy. Oh, he's looking good. Compared to that tax collector, I'm looking good. I'm righteous. It's totally comparison driven. His spiritual pride has become an idol. His self-righteousness has become an idol. He was worshiping an idol and not God. So in this story, Jesus tells the tax collector, doesn't even look up, but beats his chest and pleads with God for mercy because of his sin. And he ends this story, this parable, this this story to convey a point, a truth, that it is the tax collector who leaves justified. Reflect on that for a bit, maybe even longer than a bit. But back to Zach, Zacchaeus. What do we know about him? Well, he's short, tax collector. Not just a tax collector, a chief tax collector. What else? Wealthy. I mean, it seems like from a world standpoint, kind of had everything made, except he didn't have many friends except other tax collectors. How did the people view Zacchaeus? You can answer with one word. Sinner. Capitals. All caps. Perhaps they viewed him as a traitor. They didn't think he was somebody worthwhile. Certainly not somebody to spend time with because he was a sinner. And obviously they were not sinners. Well, maybe not as much of a sinner as Zacchaeus. But they clearly see his sin in their minds as as being far more egregious than their own by comparison. And they're mortified. Jesus invited himself to be a guest at this person's house. He's a sinner. But what does Jesus see? He sees a man clinging to a tree. First off, that's pretty undignified. Second, it seems to indicate that there's a a bit of a desperation on Zacchaeus' part to catch a glimpse of this guy Jesus he sees a man lost a son of Abraham who needs to be restored and we hear that in the end of this account with with Zacchaeus and all those surrounding Jesus says in front of everybody the son of man has come to seek and save the lost he sees Zacchaeus as lost In the second encounter we look at, that was read for us, you see a Pharisee named Simon has invited Jesus for dinner. Now this would have been customary for a religious leader, for a Pharisee or somebody in that town to invite a visiting rabbi, especially of the renown of Jesus, to be a guest. And it would have been customary also to allow folks in that area to sort of to have access be sort of like an open house so here he was having this famous rabbi jesus come in and have dinner but then it turns all wrong in this account the woman who lived a sinful life came in was truly acting in an undignified way she was at jesus feet crying my goodness, what, what is wrong with this woman? She's crying. It's just like, we're having dinner here. And not only is she crying, she's crying on Jesus' feet. She's getting his feet wet with her tears. It gets worse. She's wiping his feet with her hair, which would have been even more undignified and probably indicate that she was a woman of ill repute because her hair was down in the first place. What's she doing? Kissing his feet? This is crazy. This is undignified. 
What does Jesus say? What does he do? What does he see? First, we have to understand how Simon saw this. Simon the Pharisee was so, like, beside himself, epiplectic, if you would, says, if Jesus was so great, I'm not sure even why I had him over at dinner. If he was so great, if he was a prophet that, he, that people say that he is, had any ounce of who people say, if he just, just, he would know who it is that's touching him, what kind of woman she is, a sinner. He would know that. And it seems that Simon is not a sinner at least comparatively speaking. What does Jesus see in this woman? Desperation? Brokenness? Humility? Heart overwhelmed by love? Yes, she is a sinner, but in her brokenness, she pours out raw love for Jesus and does what Simon failed to do. Simon didn't greet Jesus with a kiss, and yet she's kissing his feet. Simon didn't give him anything to wash with, and yet she's washing his feet with her tears. Didn't provide any oil, yet she anointed him with his perfume. And it is this woman who doesn't say anything. There's nothing recorded. She doesn't speak a word according to this account. She's just kind of doing all this without saying a thing. And it is this woman Jesus declares forgiven. In our last account, we'll look at a a similar trend. This is in John 8, the first few verses. A woman caught in adultery. What does that look like? Were there folks kind of spying the windows, creeping? What what does that even look like? But she's caught in adultery, and she's brought before Jesus and made to stand there in front of the crowd. She is a sinner and deserves death as stated in the law of Moses, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees say, and they ask this rabbi, what say you? Well, as we look at the text, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law really didn't care about the woman. She was just being used to trap him, to trap Jesus. Because if he said, Stoner, they would run to Rome and say, well, he's, he's circumventing the Roman law. But if he says, don't stoner, well, he's not even a good Jew. But they continue. What do you say? So Jesus does the only natural thing in the world. He stoops down and starts writing in the ground. Makes sense. What he's writing, everybody's speculating what he's writing. Is he writing their names? Is he writing the Ten Commandments? Or what's he writing? No one knows. All he's doing is writing. Is he doodling? Is he drawing pictures? No one knows. He's just writing. But what is kind of obvious is now the eyes, the focus is not on the women, but all of a sudden on Jesus bending down right in the ground. What's he doing? Now to put this into context or perspective... Maybe we should think about some of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder. My guess is that none of you have murdered anybody, especially some of you younger folks. My guess is none of you have done that. But Jesus goes on to say, but I tell you, Anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. That makes me squirm a little bit. I have to confess. One of the words I found myself using quite a bit is idiot. I can't believe somebody cuts me off of traffic. You idiot. 
Somebody has a different view of something. You idiot. Can't you see? Obviously, this is the way it should be. And yet, when I'm thinking about Jesus' definition of murder, what he's saying is, you're guilty. This is you. But he goes on. And you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So back to this encounter. Here, a woman is caught in adultery, sinner, and Jesus is spending who knows how long writing on the ground, listening to their constant questioning, and finally he straightens up and says, let any of you who is without sin to be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stoops down and starts writing on the ground again. Now the older folks are the first to drop their stones and walk away. I think, and I've told my young friends this, is because I've just had a lot more years to sin. You're young and kind of ambitious and, and whatever the word is, but just you wait. <laughs> so the older folks leave first and soon there's no one standing there. Everyone walks away and he asks the woman, where are, there, where are your accusers? Is there anyone who accuses you? No one, sir. And neither do I. Go and sin no more. Are we willing to drop our stones in recognition of our own sinfulness when we feel tempted to judge others? We are so often quick to pick those stones up instead of looking with compassion and seeing those who are lost, broken, in need of reconciliation with God. There is no one righteous. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one does what is right and never sins. And this thought is expressed in Psalm 14 and 53, and which Paul quotes in Romans 3 and then confirms, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's be clear. In all these encounters, Jesus never denies the sin of Zacchaeus or the two women. He doesn't correct the crowd saying, but Zach, he's, he's a good guy. He's just misunderstood. He's, he's kind of cool. Never says that. He never denies sinful behavior. But he sees lostness, hurt, brokenness, and a desperation in each of them. He sees sinners who need to have an encounter with God in the flesh. No one is beyond reach of God, but there are those, there is always a call to live a new life, a life in obedience. You know, I've read a number of books written by one time atheists. You know, one of the common denominators that each of them have? They have someone who loves them, someone who's willing to walk beside them, not condemn them, but just walk beside them. And time and time again, they'll point to that one person who just unconditionally loved them to the feet of Christ. I've read four or five stories. C.S. Lewis, you could probably add into that. That's the common denominator. But what would have happened in these accounts... If Jesus had said, you know what, you're right. This sinner is not worth my time, not worth the effort. I'm not, forget it, Zacchaeus, I'm taking that back. I'm not coming to your house after all. What hope would we have today? What if grace didn't prevail? What if all Zacchaeus and the woman, women heard was a religious hate and scorn? What if that's all they heard? What would their stories have been? John, in his gospel, he introduces his gospel in the first 18 
verses, I would say, is his thesis statement, and twice he says that Jesus comes full of truth and full of grace. So often I think we are so focused on the truth part. Sinner may be true that we don't, the people miss hearing grace. Paul said he was the worst of sinners. And he was overwhelmed by grace. To think of ourselves with sober judgment means, and we have to go back to Romans 1, 12, 1, in view of God's mercy. So Paul, when he's saying think about yourselves in sober judgment, is connected to the thought in view of God's mercy. We cannot and should not lose sight of the cross ever. But the sin of pride in comparison is subtle and powerful. That somehow we forget how God dealt with us. So often, and, and maybe I should just speak for myself here, I look at the world with self righteous, prideful, comparative judgment and focus on sinner. But yet, the more I continue to, to examine these counts, the more I realize. I'm probably more akin to the Pharisees in the temple, the Pharisee in the temple or the Pharisees and the religious leaders than I really want to admit. There was a story that a newspaper in England asked some famous writers during the 1900 era. Uh, if you're a G.K. Chesterton fan, it would have been folks who would have been around his time. Uh, it would have been Wells and Chesterton and others. But the newspaper was asking them to respond to a question, what's wrong with the world today? And I think they got a response that I don't think they expected. I'll read his lengthy response for you. Dear sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. While we look at the woman, while we look at our Zacchaeus's, and women of ill repute and other sinners. We can somehow so easily become the crowd, the Pharisees, or those who are enamored with their own righteousness and look on others with a scornful look. How is that helping them know the love of God and the forgiveness of God? If all they feel is scorn. Again, John clearly states that Jesus came into this world full of truth and full of grace. In these encounters, Jesus never denies the truth of their sin. But there is grace. And these folks were so desperate for it. Zacchaeus climbs a tree. A woman crashes a party. One was desperate just because she was dragged in front of a crowd. Comparison is straight from the pit of hell. It can make us think poorly of ourselves, but more often it makes us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The truth is we're all sinners in the need of grace. And praise be to God that there is one who can forgive our sins and save us. Let's remember in Paul's words in Galatians 5, 6, the only Thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then he says this in Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continued debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. May we as his kingdom people live in the grip of grace. May we as his kingdom people live in the grip of love. May we extend both to those around us as ambassadors of King Jesus. Let us not only rely on that grace for ourselves, but also to lean on it and remember it when we think of others. Somebody came to me at the end of the second service and asked, but we live in a world that is, doesn't even know how sinful they are. How do we deal with that? I agree. 
we pray. We love. Again, Jesus said, love your enemies. Scripture clearly says we were once enemies of God, but God so loved. So let us not just rely on that grace for ourselves, but also lean on it. Remember it when we think of others. Let us pray to see all people as Jesus does, worthy of redemptive love. No one is beyond the reach of God. That's one of the stumbling blocks that often people have. I mean, God can forgive somebody like Hitler. So let me give you a hypothetical. If Hitler on his deathbed says he totally, sincerely repents that he would be saved. I don't like it, but according to Scripture, yes. Can't buy it. Can't buy it. Christianity was one of the most inclusive faiths in the world. Because it's not about you and your righteousness. It's about grace. It's about what God has done, not what you can do. And I see the wheels spinning, turning, trying to wrestle with that thought. It's about what God has done. It's about grace. This is in no way discounting sin. But we should never forget our own sin and that God so loves us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I pray that we would never lose sight of what it cost you to redeem us, to bring us home. May we live in the grip of grace and may we be, not be stingy with it. May we love in spite of even those who criticize us and we see as an enemy. May we love because you loved us. Move us to be your people. I pray if there's any offensive way in us that you would show us and reveal it to us and lead us in a way everlasting. It's your name we pray. Amen.
we can never forget that truth. Especially when we view others. We can never forget that truth, that what Jesus did for us. So here, again, the words from Paul. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I feel like I want to wrestle Paul for that because I know my heart. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. The way God deals with us is to be revealed to those who are searching, who are hurting, who are broken, who are lost. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go live boldly in the grip of grace. And the grip of love, extending truth and grace, never err one side or the other. Full of truth, full of grace. Go in peace. Mm-hmm.